loner. Thank you, Katie, for your computer. <laughs> Hopefully we won't have any. My computer all week was just, oh yeah. I'm surprised I got anything done. All right. Jude, we will read verses uh, 3 and 4, and then we will jump to uh, verses 20 and following. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. I take you back to verse 3, and I, I'm, this morning I'm going to sort of give a little bit of a broad look at Jude to sort of frame things for you a little bit. But before we come into this passage, some things that have been on my mind, and I've made reference to these before, and... I wanted to bring them to your minds as we come back to this passage, especially in light of verse 3 and the petition that is given there to contend earnestly for the faith. There have been some who suggested that we are in the age of the evangelical decline, and actually it's been coming for a while. And actually we could take it all the way back to 1999 is actually when the, the, the supposed decline started to come in the evangelical church. But there are those who would sort of describe the age in which we live in as being the post-Christian America or the post-evangelical culture, indicating that there is a decline in the evangelical church and we would consider ourselves to be a part of that. The problem, though, in regards to this is it doesn't necessarily have to do with our president, although he's not the greatest president. And there have been a lot of downward movements within this nation during his presidency. The issue isn't near, merely just the, the moralist kind of TV shows and the movement that's happened even in culture. We can see it on the television. It's interesting because, you know, watching when I was a kid, you look at the things that are on TV now, there's no way that they would air such stuff back then. And it's amazing the stuff that they allow to come about now. But that's really not our problem, ultimately. The problem isn't just with politics, and it isn't merely just society. And it's interesting because I heard an interesting statement the other day that politics is downstream from culture. And I'll let you just sort of dwell on that one for a little bit. It's an intriguing thought. The problem, though, for us is the fact that the unraveling isn't that it's happening out in the world. The problem is it's happening within the confines of the church. It's in the walls of the church. It's in our midst. And this is the thing that Jude addresses, and when you look throughout church history, we find this to be the problem, that there's always going to be that struggle within the confines of the church of Jesus Christ. Out of our fear of being falsely dubbed intolerant or uncompassionate, which you know many do, you can't speak the truth, that's not loving, that's not caring, but the reality of it is, if we don't speak the truth, we are not loving and we are not compassionate. Many young Christians then are buying into the theological falsehoods from popular evangelical ministers and writers. However, they, their feel-good theology sidesteps all biblical principles that indicate any kind of ex exclusivity. I mean, when you look at Christianity, that is what we're dealing with, and that's why we're dubbed as being intolerant, because we're saying that Christ is exclusive. And it's not just we are saying that. Christ himself says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way unto the Father but by me. That's exclusive. And so we have those who are saying, well, we got to be more compassionate, more loving, so therefore we can't be so exclusive in our teaching, we can't be so constricting, and so therefore those who would suggest that we are are being deemed as intolerant and uncompassionate and unloving. But we have more and more believers who are being influenced by these kinds of teachers who are giving over the, the basic truths of Christianity. 
and they're given into these feel-good messages and this light, airy theology, and there is no depth. Someone suggested that if evangelicalism was the ocean and you were a man floating in a boat and you fell overboard, you'd have no problem and no worry about drowning. In other words, we are that shallow in the church these days. David Wells makes this statement, Popular evangelical faith has developed a bias against theology. And what is more, it has elevated the bias to the level of virtue, defending it as vigorously as democracy. There are those who are saying, you know what, it's about doing, not about knowing. It doesn't matter the doctrine, the theology. It's just that you do. And very well-known churches, and if I listed them, you would know them, very well-known mega churches closed their doors on a particular Sunday and said, we're going to go serve our communities on Sunday, no worship service for the body. We're going to go out in the world and we're going to serve the poor and do all these things. And I have no problem with that. My problem is, is that you close the doors on Sunday, the day that the church is to be fed and edified and built up, and you you're going to close the doors to go out and do service. And the point they were making is it's not about the theology or the doctrine. It's just about the doing. There are many who are in the church who would suggest that, look, I don't care if it's right or wrong, just as long as it works. And so don't bother with the theology. Don't bother with the doctrine. Don't bother even with the principles. Just give me the pragmatics. Tell me what to do. But if we look at Scripture, it's permeated with, here is the doctrine, this is how you behave. I mean, every epistle of Paul, you can break it up that way. Doctrine, behavior, doctrine, behavior. So all we're doing is just following that pattern, but there is a progression away from that. A pastor, he said once, he said, I have friends who tell me that a working knowledge of the Bible does not matter. The Christian faith, they argue, is a matter of faith and the spirit, not reason, not theology. There is a man who sits on the board uh, of Eternal Truth Ministries, a ministry my father started years ago. has been all over the place throughout the world helping churches get back on track biblically. And he sits on the board and he was sharing. He teaches at a very well-known Christian university and if I told you the name, you'd know it. And he said, you know, it's astounding to me how many young people do not care about theology. They just don't care. We have a generation that is coming up in the church who has no care about doctrine. This is crucial for us when we come to verse 3 because we are to be contending for the faith. This is Jude's exhortation to the church and he begins the introduction into the letter and this is the opening to the body of the letter, verses 3 and 4, as he gives the reason for why he is writing and there is a transition in the purpose for why he writes. But these verses are important in relation to the rest of the letter and so I want to spend a little bit of time as we get into them to talk about the issue of these verses because they establish the occasion and the subject matter that Jude is going to address in the letter. And it's a short letter, but context is everything. When I taught in the seminary overseas, that's what we did with the brothers. We just context, context, context. Everything is context. You have to let the text drive you, and you have to know the context. So we're going to talk about context because I'm not going to go all the way through Jude. So I'm going to give you this. These are breadcrumbs for you. And you can come back to this later in your own time and spend time walking through Jude. But basically, verses 5 through 19 are essentially a development of verse 4. Verse 4, Jude is going to give the reason why he writes that there are those who have infiltrated the church. They are corrupting and they are having a negative influence, a very negative influence, not only turning away from the gospel, but also from the moral demands of the gospel. They have turned the grace of God into licentiousness, denying our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're having this influence upon the church. Verses 5 through 19 elaborate on verse 4. It helps to establish the reason for why he is writing. And he's going to talk about the punishment of these false teachers and how it has been prophesied beforehand. And there are what we call catchwords that happen here. So if you look at verse 4, we have the word condemnation. In verses 6 and 15, we have the word judgment, but actually it's the same root word in Greek. It is the word for condemnation. This is a very Jewish way of writing. In the Old Testament, I love Psalms and Proverbs. We have these catchwords that help bind things together, especially Proverbs. 
So there are these catch words that Jude uses to bind these sections together. If you notice in verse 4, we have the reference to the ungodly. In verses 15 and 18, we have a return back to the ungodly. So we see this connection with verse 4 to verses 5 through 19. And Jude helps bring our attention this way by the repetition of these particular terms that he uses here. So he binds this section together. And it is the middle section of the letter. So we have the apostates described verse 4. Then they're going to be described again in verses 17 through 19. We have apostasy in Old Testament history, apostasy in Old Testament prophecy, and then we have apostasy in the supernatural realm and in the natural realm. In other words, this apostasy is a cosmic apostasy. That's why we have a cosmic Savior bringing a cosmic salvation, Colossians chapter 1. He has reconciled all things to God, both things in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Yes? Because the tainting of sin must be met by the grace of God. Has to. Has to. So this is the center section of Jude's letter. And verse 4 gives us the trigger. Verses 5 through 19 elaborate on it. Verse 3 gives us the main petition to the letter. Now this is important because it is connected with verses 20 through 23. And essentially verses 20 through 23 are not an appendix. They are a part of the petition of verse 3. So if you want to see an elaboration on Jude's petition in verse 3 to contend for the faith, verses 20 through 23 explain what he means by that. And he takes our understanding of it further. And notice the catch words. We have saints used in verse 3. And then again we have the word holy, which is the same root used in verse 20. And then we have the word faith that binds verse 3 and verse 20 together. And so therefore he binds these sections together. So the middle section is just the basis of the background for why he writes the petition is really verse 3 and verses 20 through 23. And if you want to know what to do, those are the verses to look for what to do. So we could look at it this way as we saw the assurance of the believer in verse 1 and verses 24 through 25. We could look at it this way. The assurance is God's part. God has loved us. We stand in the state of being loved by God. We stand in the state of being kept by God. And in verse 24 and 25 comes back to the fact that we will be kept by God. That's his part. But then we have our part, and that comes in verse 3 and verses 20 through 23. We are to contend for the faith. And I love this. God has his part. We have our part. We are in the love of God, and we abide in that love of God. But then he challenges us at the, at the same time in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. We have a responsibility. We have a part in this. So the reality of it is that when we look at this great and glorious salvation that we have, we don't just sit back, kick our feet up, and relax spiritually. We have something we need to do. And Jude says you need to contend for the faith. That's your job. The original purpose for writing was out of his love and care for the brethren. And he's, he acknowledges in verse 3 as he refers to them as the beloved and the fact that he had planned to write to them long before and expresses his earnest care and compassion for them that he wanted to write. And the terminology that's used here is that Jude had the intent of writing a long doctrinal treatise like the book of Romans or Hebrews. The terminology he uses was that he was building up this case and, and whether he started writing or was just thinking through the process of what he was going to write, he had an intent out of his love for them to develop this long doctrinal treatise about this common salvation that we had, but he was compelled by the Holy Spirit to write something other. But he mentions this common salvation, and I just give you this thought. Some have suggested that when Jude mentions salvation, he's just merely talking about the personal possession we have now, that we are saved and we have salvation now. We look in 1 Peter 1, 5, where he talks about salvation that is yet to be revealed in the last time. Hebrews talks about a salvation that is still yet to come as we wait for the return of Christ. There is an eschatological salvation, and some have suggested Jude doesn't go there, but I would tell you that he does go there. He absolutely does go there. This is what's so intriguing to me about this letter. One chapter, 25 verses, okay? But notice what he deals with. He deals with preservation at the beginning and preservation at the end. This is the not yet part of the Christian life. We are still waiting for the final completion of our salvation, the consummation of what God started in us. There is that not yet aspect, and this is Jude's worldview. He sees the plan of God, and that's why he doesn't get flustered when he deals with the apostates. He doesn't run like chicken little into the hills saying that the apostates have come, the apostates have come. No, he braces the church with great truth about God is sovereignly under control, and he has all of this in control, but we must still contend for the faith. 
But it's interesting that even though he looks to the not yet, there is this present aspect in which we possess the salvation now. And not only that, but it comes with its responsibility. Verse 21, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. And not only that, we are to contend for the faith. So really, in this one chapter, we have this full scope of salvation that Jude deals with. The already, we possess it now. The not yet, and what we do in between time. And it is possible, I will plant this thought in your head, another breadcrumb for you, but it is possible that Jude deals with the perseverance of the saints. And I just stick that in your head, but notice verse 5. Notice what he says. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not what? Believe. Believe. I would tell you, though, that I do not think that that is explicitly teaching the doctrine of preservation, but it definitely opens the door. And I just tell you to read the rest of Jude's letter because there is much here in regards to our salvation. And as he walks through this letter, the short statements that he makes in regards to salvation we have, he talks about the corporate nature of it. It is a common salvation. It belongs to all of us. He is conscious of the fact that we are the people of God, the conviction that we are in fellowship with Christ. It is an eschatological deliverance. What God has started, He will finish. It is equally free, abundant, and it is secure. I have no problem with talking about the security and the assurance that we have as believers. Amen? I had to someone call interested in the church, and I, and I get these often. Everybody, you find out where everyone's theological hotspot is, right? So I had a, a, a brother call, and he says, do you believe in eternal security? Yes, click. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. I was like, we don't want to discuss passages at all. Just It's over with, but they're there. They're there. And there's no escaping the first verse of Jude's letter. The altered purpose for writing was by compulsion, but he challenges them to contend for the faith. And we started to look at this, contending for the faith will be a determined, strenuous conflict. And it is a conflict. And he does not use the shorter term here. He uses a compound form. But the term in and of itself talks about contending. It talks about struggle. It is intensive. This is why I think the preposition on the front of it, epi, and I talked about this before, the preposition epi on the front means upon. I don't think that it's being used in an intensive way here. It is elaborating further meaning in regards to this contending for the faith. The reason for that is because the, the root of the term he uses here enough stresses an intense struggle. He doesn't need to intensify it. Not only that, but in verse 20. He says, my beloved, building yourselves, notice, up on your most holy faith. Up on. This is the preposition epi on the participle that he uses here for building yourselves. Up on. He doesn't use it for intensification. He shows the basis upon which we build ourselves up on the most holy faith. So he uses the preposition again in a very similar way in his exact same book in connection with his petition in verse 3. He comes back to it in verse 20. And so... Just so you don't take my word for it, I have reasons for why I take it that way, right? And so just so you understand that this isn't just merely my opinion on it, but following the Greek grammar and the context, Jude is telling me this is how I must understand it. And so he says we need to contend earnestly for the faith, resting upon the very thing that we are seeking to defend and retain. So we contend for the faith, standing upon the faith, that foundation of truth that establishes us as a Christian church and as believers. These are foundational truths that we cannot catapult. And we'll see that as we talk about what is the faith here that he references. So we are essentially soldiers for Jesus Christ in this conflict, and we take our battle stations upon the faith, defending and retaining it at all costs. The conflict is continuous. This we see in the form that he uses. This is what we call present tense. Now, in Greek grammar, present doesn't mean the here and now. It is about continuous action. For the Greek mind, the Hebrew mind, kind of action, not time, is, is, is not the focus. Kind of action is the focus. For us in America, everything's about time, right? Everything's time. We live by the watch. We live by the, the calendar. We die by both, right? For them, it isn't that. It's about the kind of action. So when we talk about present tense in Greek, we're talking about continuous action. 
So he's talking about the fact that we must continuously be contending for the faith. This is an ongoing struggle. This is an ongoing battle. There is a habitual course to our contending for the faith. In other words, in my lifetime, so long as I live, I will be contending for the faith. It will never end. And as my children grow up, they will also contend for the faith. And it will go on and on and on and on until the Lord returns. If the contending is an ongoing base, then we also understand that the apostasy is going to be ongoing in its course. It is going to grow in severity, as we find from the rest of the New Testament, that men are going to go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, and it will go on, as Paul warns in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The conflict will reach a point of extreme severity, and, and this is seen in the term that he uses, and it's from Agon, and it talks about the issue of anguish, the most severe struggles and emotions. This is a term that, that is used in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is agonizing over facing the cross that looms before him, and his sweat become like drops of blood. I mean, just think about the strain that was on his body physically that blood started to pour forth with his sweat. Some suggest the corpuscles, whatever, and they rupture, and that is the strain that he was under. This is the term. This term is used oftentimes in reference to our Christian life, the kind of effort and strain we are to put into it. This is the kind of struggle. It is going to be intense. It is going to be strenuous. It is the nature of the conflict. Paul uses it in regards to his own life in 2 Timothy as he looks back at the course of his life from the road to Damascus to the point where he sits in Roman imprisonment and he says, I have fought the good fight. And he uses this term, agona. I have agonized the good agony. I have strained and I have gone through this. And then he exhorts Timothy in chapter, one, or chapter 6, verse 12. He says, I want you to fight the good fight. Agony, the good agony. He uses stronger terminology in the first part of 1 Timothy when he says, war, the good warfare. We're in battle. So we understand the conflict. And if you read Ephesians chapter 6, we'll see the severity of the conflict that is against spiritual forces. But some thoughts about contending for the faith. First, it's not merely negative. Okay? It's positive. And, and the reason why I brought out the connection between verse 3 and verses 20 through 23 is to show you that there are positive elements in that when he tells us to build ourselves up in the faith. And then he goes to talk about our positive ministry in the relation to others. Notice with me in verse 22 and 23, And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. There is a positive element to our contending for the faith. We are to be seeking souls to be saved saved and reclaimed and redeemed by our Savior Jesus Christ. There is a positive aim to this contending. It's not just about the opposition or refuting the opposition. And some have built their ministry on this, picking fights with the enemy, calling them out, seeking to defame them. But that's not the focal point for us. It's interesting because Jude doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about their false teaching. And it's interesting that when you look at some of the other writers in the New Testament, the epistles, they don't necessarily call out every single person they're contending with. Paul doesn't do this in Colossians, although when he talks about in chapter 2 about the philosophy, he has a specific person in mind as he's talking about the philosophy, and it's a specific philosophy, but he doesn't mention them by name. He doesn't want to give them credence. He doesn't want to legitimize the false teachers. Sometimes we do that when we spend so much more attention on them than on the positive aspect of contending for the faith as far as establishing the truth of the gospel and the truth of the faith. So our ministry about contending for the faith isn't just about discrediting the opponent and defaming them. It is about establishing the truth. It is about advancing the gospel and its victory over the world. Contending for the faith demands that the life of the defender must also embody the gospel. Morgan, G.C. Morgan said this, he says, The final argument for the faith in the world is not the argument of words, but the argument of life. See, how can we say that we believe in these cardinal truths, these foundational truths of the Christian faith, and yet in everything that we do, we deny them? It's hypocrisy. And the world says that to us. Well, you say you believe this, but then you act this way. You say you believe in a sovereign God, but then when something bad happens in your life, you go freaking out. You say you believe in a sovereign God, and yet you, in every area of your life, want to control and manipulate and cajole and drive everything by your own will and desires rather than by yielding to His. 
right? There are so many ways in which we say, I believe this, and yet with our own life, we deny the very truth we say we believe. But this is not a world problem. This is an us problem. This is a me problem. So the contending for the faith isn't merely just in word only. It's also in our life. And you, it's interesting because Jude doesn't lay out all the different ways that we will contend for the faith. But I would suggest you read every epistle in the New Testament. You'll find all the different ways to contend for the faith. Yes? Every single one. Talks about how we contend for the faith by how we live our life, how we speak to others, how we treat others, how we walk, how we behave. Contending for the faith is never easy nor a popular task. Only earnest believers will earnestly contend for the faith. William says this, Indifference to error is a sign of liberalism and humiliating weakness. There are those who don't care if it's right or wrong. We've got to care. That's a part of contending for the faith. Sound doctrine and theology is crucial. It's crucial because we behave what we believe. Even if you want to say, I want to set aside doctrine and theology, you don't. Even unbelievers have a theology. It's an atheology. They even have their own eschatology, right? If we don't hug a tree and save the earth, it's all going to come to an end. It's either going to freeze or heat up, right? That's eschatology. Everyone has a religion. Don't let science fool you to suggest that somehow they're completely objective. They're not. They're driven by a philosophy. They were driven by a religious ideal that God does not exist. That's their premise. That's their presupposition. Contending for the faith effectively is going to be costly and agonizing. It is the duty of every believer to contribute toward the defense and preservation of this faith. And he deals with that as he talks about contending for this one holy faith that we possess. And let's just walk through this statement that Jude makes. There is much here, and uh, <clears throat> I've tried to condense it down. Man, I just, there's just so much in this letter, just tell you, just please go back and study it on your own. Jude, he is so revealing about the nature of faith. And we could run past this statement, contending for the faith, and as he elaborates, for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. He packages this whole thing, just like he did at the beginning of his letter. I love this. So here we have, and, and I give you the exact literal order in English. Here's the Greek transliterated for you. But it begins with the article and ends with the noun faith. And everything is couched in between that once. So it is the once for all having been delivered to the saints, faith. In other words, all the modifiers about this faith are couched within the context of this article and this noun, which are bound together. And it delineates the intrinsic nature of this faith. This is crucial. Because any faith that does not fit the characteristics of this faith is not worth defending. So instead of me running all over the scriptures trying to define what this faith, the Jude defines the faith for us so clearly for us, contextually, in just a few words. So let's walk through the forest a little bit. Here's the first aspect of the faith. What does he mean by that? Some have suggested that he means the subjective aspect of faith, our trusting, our believing. Typically, when we have the article on the front of it, which we have here, it is referring to not the trusting aspect of faith, not the belief, not that subject part, but the traditional teaching. It is that body of truth. It is the objective truths that we as believers firmly adhere to and give our lives to and base our lives off of. And that is what he's talking about here. It is the objective body of truth. And I'll just tell you, the, the, the legitimacy of our faith is determined by what it rests upon. Because we have such a body of truth, it is absolute and is objective from God, then my faith in it is very sure and it is stable and it is sound. You look at the Old Testament, those who were condemned when they put their faith in a block of stone or a 
piece of tree that they've carved into some sort of shape or form to be their deity. Their faith was empty and hollow and worthless and not lasting and there was nothing to it, no stability to it because of what it rested in. So much of our faith is determined by what calls it into existence. And here we see that all the way back from the early beginning of the church, they had a body of truth that they clung to. The first summation statement that, that Luke gives us in Acts in regards to church, and he does it, he gives us these little summary statements throughout Acts to talk about the life of the church. And one of the first ones he gives us in chapter 2, verse 42, and the first thing he says that the church adhered to was the teaching of the apostles. That is what we have in the epistles given to us in the New Testament. It is the teaching of the apostles, and it is that doctrine, that body of truth that we must adhere to, and it is that we much, must contend for and fight for. It is that foundation for Christianity, and we must take that, and it is that in which we rest our faith, but it is also that from which we must contend and fight for. The other statement he says is that this faith, this objective body of truth, was once for all delivered. The adverb here is hapax, and it does not merely denote a past occurrence with the King James translation would indicate, which was once delivered. That's not the point of the term. It's used in a very classical sense, meaning once only or once for all. In other words, no additions, no subtractions. If you look at the context of Jude, they are trying to thwart and undermine the solid foundation of the Christian faith, perverting the grace of God with licentiousness, denying the one and only Master and Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. All the way through here, Jude deals with the fact that they are perverting the truth, that basis of truth, that foundation for us. This is, going back to the Old Testament, you think about this, right? When it came to behavior, you turn not to the right nor to the left, right? You keep your foot on the path. When it came to the Word of God, the written part of our faith in the Old Testament, he would say, do what? Do not add to or subtract from. That's a tough life to live. Think about this. In behavior and in holding to what is true, we don't turn to the right or the left and we do not add or subtract from. That's tough. I had a brother who finally came to understand how to preach the scriptures exegetically driven. And he said, man, this is tough. I'm used to topical stuff. I can jump all over the place and pick verses out of everywhere. And I don't have to be fixed to a context. He says, it's tough not adding or subtracting, just saying everything that is there and nothing that isn't. That's tough. That takes work. That takes discipline. And far too many brothers who are fulfilling this ministry that God has entrusted to them who are not taking that task on and they're being lazy in the work and they do not want to put the time in and they are leading the people astray because they are not ground in the truth of the Word of God. Praise God for MacArthur and others who have stood over the test of time, but they are becoming less and less and less. This is a once only, once for all delivered thing. We're always looking for the newest thing, the best thing. What, what's the newest teaching? What's the latest gimmick? No. The same old, same old. That's what we're after. That's why my dad would go around the world and helping churches and I would just tell them, look, he's not going to give you anything new. He's going to come back to the same old stuff. Our problem is we keep deviating from it because we keep chasing off of these rabbit trails of new stuff. Listen, upgrade is fine when it comes to electronics, but not when it comes to the Word of God. You don't advance beyond that which stands written. The foundation of truths of the Christian faith then are non-negotiable. They're unalterable. These are truths we live and die on. We must. The doctrine of the Trinity, crucial. It's crucial. When you have Joe Ho's witness come to your front door and says, you know that the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, don't listen to me. The doctrine is there, and you must defend it to the end. Because if the doctrine of the Trinity is not true, our salvation is not. We have nothing. Notice this, the faith was delivered. In other words, we didn't manufacture it, we didn't discover it ourselves. This was something that was entrusted to us, authoritatively handed down as a precious deposit. We have been given this trust that has been recorded for us, but what's interesting about this statement that Jude makes, he uses a passive participle, but he does not name who the agent is. Now, we automatically understand and, and 
commentators will say, oh, he's obviously talking about the apostles. And yes, the apostles passed on the apostolic teaching, that doctrinal truth. But I would suggest to you that the passive voice here is talking about God himself. He is the original one who delivered this truth. You look at Paul when he talks to the church of Corinth. The Lord trusted me this, and now I pass it on to you. So the original agent is God himself. He passed it on to the apostles. The apostles have passed it on to the early church, and it continues to be passed on to us. It is a trust that has been handed to us, and we are to maintain it, and we are to defend it. Therefore, this statement of being delivered not only talks about the grace of God, it also talks about the duty of the church. It's not just for pastors and elders and those in leadership. It is for everyone in the body of Christ to contend for this body of truth. Therefore, we must know it. The faith was delivered to the saints. It was delivered to the possession of not just a local body of believers, nor to specific church leaders, nor to a denomination. Okay? It was delivered to all the saints. Everyone. This is vital. So many churches out there it just man, act like they're the, they're the only thing going. No, this is not. We're not. And I try to keep myself connected with the broader body of Jesus Christ through so many different means and have so many different relationships with other pastors around the U.S. To maintain that relationship of understanding, look, we're not the only thing that is going. There is the universal body of Jesus Christ that exists. And we need to maintain that relationship. And this faith has been passed on to everybody. You, me, all of us. In all of our lives, whatever we do, however it is, even in the home, you are contending for the faith. People look at you as a wife and mother and how you treat your husband and your children. And read Titus chapter 2. They will weigh the validity of the word of God by your behavior. You contend for the faith by being a good wife and mother. Even the seemingly mundane things that we do in life are about contending for the faith. Our occupation is the mission field. That is where we contend for the faith. It is the duty of successive generations then to faithfully transmit this faith that they have received. We all must do this. Jude then will move in to talk about the charge in regards to these false teachers. I challenge you to come back and spend time in Jude. We will probably spend one more Sunday here as we look at verses 20 and following of what he talks about building ourselves up in the faith, praying in the Spirit, how we are to help those who are doubting, snatch those from the fire. But I pray that you would take time going through this little book. It oftentimes is eclipsed by the enormity of Revelation, but it is an amazing letter. And there is so much truth here. So please don't pass by it. Although revelation is important, don't pass by Jude. Right? Even the little guys have something to show us. Robert, would you close in a word of prayer, please?